In the past two months, we've moved weapons and equipment to Ukraine at record speed. Drones, grenade launchers, machine guns. We're seeing this incredible historic flow of weapons coming into Ukraine. Do we have any sense as to where they're going? We don't know. There is really no information as to where they're going uh, at all. You know, all this stuff goes to the border and then kind of like something happens, it kind of like 30% maybe reaches its final destination. 30%? Are you concerned about weapons getting in the wrong hands? I don't care at all whether that happens. What sort of a unit do you command? Uh, Can't say. Okay. You know, there are like power lords, uh, oligarchs, uh, political players. One of the biggest targets are convoys like this transporting weapons. Europeans had come to believe that that project of integration had effectively meant the banishment of armed force. All of a sudden, not far from the borders of the EU was the most significant war since World War II. So this is a NATO exercise happening in Lithuania, which is effectively the eastern flank of the entire alliance, effectively the front line. And exercises like this have been happening for quite some time, but have taken on much greater urgency. Outside the borders of Ukraine, NATO countries are on alert as they strike a fragile balance between providing support to Ukraine and preventing a full-scale war between Russia and NATO. My intent for today is twofold. First, to see the successful integration of the German reinforcement troops we sent in March, based on the, of course, war in, in Ukraine. For me, it's absolutely clear Germany will remain committed, not only in the EFP business, but also in, in NATO. It is admittedly feels like a little bit of a dog and pony show, almost like a, an open house or a showcase of all the weapons that are being purchased and, and sent into Ukraine. I think that we're arguably at the most dangerous point since the Cuban Missile Crisis. NATO is not directly at war with Russia, but a nuclear-armed Russia is at war with a NATO-armed Ukraine. And it's conceivable that that war could widen. We don't know. But this is a hot war, not a cold war. And that's why it makes it so dangerous. Ukraine and Russia have been at war since 2014, when Russia occupied Crimea, and Russia-backed separatists occupied the Donbas region of Ukraine. But the full-blown invasion in 2022 and the images of Russian tanks en route to the nation's capital of Kyiv shook the West to its core and galvanized the US and Europe to ship an unprecedented level of military aid to Ukraine. Yeah. So how long have you been moving supplies into country? Since summer 2014. <clears throat> this whole thing, if you do it like according to the book, it takes four or five days. And I mean, we don't have that time. Right? And yeah, we go now. Welcome to Ukraine. Yeah. Jonas Oman and his team work for the non-governmental organization Blue Yellow. While weapons are pouring in, frontline fighters also need supplies like body armor helmets and other tactical gear. NGOs like Blue Yellow help fill that gap. We're just a few feet from the border. As soon as we came into the country, the convoy is starting um, a series of drop-offs. This moment, there's a huge lack of, of body armor. Yeah, we're handing out like maybe 20, 30, 50. They will just distribute it in their networks. Different so units. Yeah. Frontline soldiers don't have body armor? Yeah, 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 sure. For a country trying to defend itself against a much better funded and equipped aggressor, crews like Jonas's have become vital to navigating the tangle of supply lines to reach the patchwork of what are sometimes improvised military units. You as an NGO, you have to toe the line very carefully. You can yeah. only move non-lethal aid. Yes. 
we are cooperating with units who rely to some extent on, on you know, official support and they get weapons, etc. But they also rely on us for other things. Cars, drones, optics, etc., etc. The Russians in some ways see this as a war with the West. Ukraine is uh, a proxy for the West, but at the same time, the Russians have been as careful as NATO in not widening the war. They have not chosen to strike against arms depots in Poland, through which arms are flowing into Ukraine. And that is not surprising in the nuclear era, because everybody knows that if you have a military conflict between two sides, both of which have nuclear weapons, you never know where the war is going to go. Jonas, can you help us with 10 night vision devices for a frontline combat unit defending Kharkiv? Go there and see what we can do. One of the many challenges to getting logistics to the front line are the many roadblocks, damaged bridges, collapsed bridges, and having to go off-road and sort of improvise your way through the country. This woman, who asks that her name be withheld, is part of a network of civilian volunteers who are aiding in the war effort and act as links between groups like Jonas's and local soldiers. How critical are these supplies? Від цього від цієї допомоги залежить життя наших бійців, тому що вони коли працюють тепловізором, вони вночі бачать цілі, вони бачать супротивника, коли працюють квадрокоптери, вони бачать місце розташування противника, вони бачать скільки зброї, яка зброя готується до наступу. Тому це ну від цього залежить життя. In addition to go-betweens, Jonas also delivers directly to armed units requesting supplemental aid. We've just been escorted to a, a compound, a private compound, and Jonas and his team are delivering some aid to this unit. We can't show any faces um, because of the highly secretive nature of what these guys do. Oh, wow. What, what sort of a unit do you command? Can't say. Okay. Can you uh, walk me through some of what you have here? And then, what do you have over here? The coin. The tank. Sir, the tank. Uh, you're having to rely on on groups like Jonas's to get some of the non-lethal aid. Есть форма, есть автомат, есть пушки, снаряды и так далее. Но, допустим, есть автомат. Вот к нему нужен коллиматор. Прицел, к нему нужен лазерный целеуказатель. Это все влиял. In a war where essentially all able-bodied Ukrainian men under 60 join the fight, weapons and supplies are making their way to almost anyone willing and able to use them. This is a war that has tapped into uh, a lot of emotions. And that's why you have Americans, Europeans, others who are joining the fight. Many of them are ex-military. And so, you, you know, you have to show a certain amount of respect for those people who are volunteering, they're putting their lives at risk to help Ukraine defend its own freedom and sovereignty. Is there a downside to this? Yes, because once you get these paramilitary units, it, it's a more dangerous world where governments don't have control of what's happening on the battlefield.
были часы. 6.28. О, хлопцы, давайте нажимаем. Что на балконе должны быть нормальных людей? Да. So right now we get weapons, uh, get our armor and uh, we'll see, we'll see what the, uh, we need for this day. This commander, known as the Greek, and his unit of former civilian and paramilitary fighters will escort Jonas and his crew to the front line. His unit has the firepower to defend the convoy should they encounter ground forces. Before the convoy gets underway, they rendezvous with another crew to combine supplies headed to the front line. As we follow supply lines, both non-lethal aid and lethal aid, they kind of converge here very, very close to the front. You know, this unit gets most of its non-lethal aid from, from Jonas and his team. And um, what we're seeing is uh, all this non-lethal aid, sitting right atop some of the most effective weapons of this war. This is our weapon, which came from the west. It's what we gave to Jevelini. The commander of this unit told us that uh, if they stand still for five minutes, even less, they will start to come under fire. They've got to keep moving at all times, and one of the biggest targets are convoys like this, transporting weapons. Yo, straight ahead. What did you say? I said straight ahead. Seems there are checkpoints now, like every half kilometer to a kilometer. That was close. Как то увидели нас? Понял, друже? Вот так был пост, где мы ехали, только что въебали туда, прямо в пост. Так что see the artillery. Блять. Чела, надо рассыпаться по посадке. Я, я понял. Найди десничку, сховайте с орлами. А там орлам идет. Go to the trees. Hearing a lot of incoming and outgoing shelling. Drones overhead. This isn't much cover, but it's kind of all we got here. Тільки що ми їхали, в небі був орлан. Вони побачили точку, де ми знаходимося, побачили перехрестя, де зупиняються. І туди відпрацювали артилерію. Слава Богу, що не попали. Ми проїхали далі. Остальна наша група поїхала вперед, і там їх теж обстріляли. Вони вернулись назад, їх опять обстріляли, вони пробили колесо. Зараз він насит, ми його зараз не бачимо. Шум, його не чути. Нам треба такі прибори, які показують, де летить БПЛА. Unable to move any further and out of sight of Russian drones, both the Greek and Jonas pull back without delivering their supplies. We had been traveling in a convoy of four earlier when we encountered the shelling. We have to assume that the Russian drones had eyes on all four. So we're not traveling at fours anymore until we are well out of range. The derailing of this supply run is one of the many ways desperately needed aid doesn't always make it to the soldiers who need it. The U.S. has sent tens of thousands of anti-aircraft and anti-armor systems, artillery rounds, hundreds of artillery systems, switchblade armored drones, and tens of millions of rounds of small arms ammunition. But in a conflict where front lines are scattered and conditions change without warning, not all of those supplies reach their destination. Some also reported weapons are being hoarded, or worse, fear that they are disappearing into the black market an industry that has thrived under corruption in post-Soviet Ukraine. Anybody want to refill here? Uh, more? More, yeah, some more. 
That's for me. Okay, cool. Parodii savo baie traumas, kur apkasuose. Jūsų bomar nakome kaip, žinai. Jo, jo, jį kilimą apkasuose. Apkasuose, nes dešimt kilų šliauzė, žinai, tik mažiai. So you're cutting through bureaucracy, you're cutting through corruption. We're going around it. I mean, that's like, you know, we are masters of, you know, the... No, going around. And what is the corruption? Is it like playing favorites? Is it? You know, there are like power lords, uh, oligarchs, uh, political players. The system itself is just now we are the armed forces of Ukraine. So if the uh, security forces want to, well, yeah, the Americans escape to us. So you've got to figure it out. And it's like, it's kind of like power games all day long, basically. Yeah. And so eventually people, you know, they, they need the stuff or they are being used for so they go to us. You're gonna see one of the elite drone teams in Ukraine. And, and they requested something from you? They requested a drone like uh, to the fair amount of $200,000 and we bought it for them. And there it is. I see it. Nice. It's great. Mission successfully uploaded. Modern drones have proven to be the most successful tool in breaking frontline stalemates. We have to adapt to... To that wind, yeah. yes. So it... A former German soldier who asked to stay anonymous is instructing the unit. Yeah. How transformational have drones been for Ukraine? Uh, already it was clear in 2015 that it's going to be in drone war. Meaning, not like the, you know, the, the Reaper level, you know, drone war, drones, yeah. but uh, tactical drones for all kinds of purposes. I think I lost count how many drones we were putting here. Yeah. <laughs> Anti drone kit. Taking down drones very, very far away. So you use it as a defend, defense against drones. That is a serious looking jammer. If you provide supplies or logistics pipeline, you've got to be able, there's got to be some organization to it, right? You know, the surprise isn't that, oh, all this stuff isn't getting there. The surprise is that people actually expected it to. We're here in the uh, evacuation. Andy Milburn is a U.S. Marine veteran. Point. Unsatisfied with what he felt was a too hands-off approach from the U.S., he made his way to Kyiv after the invasion to train frontline soldiers. I can tell you unarguably that on the frontline units, these things are not getting there, all right? Um, drones, uh, switchblades, IFACs, they're not, all right? Um, body armor, helmets, you name it. Is, is it safe to characterize this as a little bit of a, a black hole? I, I, I suppose if you don't have visibility of where this stuff is going and if you're asking that question, then it would appear that it's a black hole, yeah. Are you concerned about weapons getting into the wrong hands? I don't care at all whether that happens. Of course it's going to happen. It happens in any... T I mean, if you, if you don't have guys here supervising the pipeline, but that's not my biggest concern. My biggest concern right now is that the guys who need to kill Russians with those weapons get those weapons. We're seeing this incredible historic flow of weapons coming into Ukraine from, from the West, from the US and NATO countries. Do we have any sense as to where they're going? We don't know. Uh, there is really no information as to where they're going uh, at all. What is more worrying is that at least some of the countries that are sending weapons do not seem to think that it is their responsibility to put in place a very robust oversight mechanism to ensure that they know how they're being used today, but also how they might and will be used tomorrow. Is it appropriate for us to be asking these questions in, in, in a state of emergency? You have a country that has been invaded by a larger neighboring force. Whatever it takes to survive seems to be the name of the game. It's not just that it is appropriate to ask this question. It is absolutely necessary to ask those questions because if we look back, we have so many different examples in Afghanistan, Libya, Iraq, and the situations where weapons that are meant for one purpose at a particular time end up going elsewhere, being used for other purposes. When ISIS took over Mosul in 2014, they 
you know, came into possession of large amounts of new, sophisticated weapons that U.S. forces had left for the Iraqi forces. Mm -hmm. But, you know, Iraqi forces lost control of the city, ran away, and, and all that fell into the hands uh, of ISIS. During a Department of Defense briefing in July 2022, a senior military official said that the U.S. is not tracking weapons, but are confident military aid is being used to combat Russian forces. And on July 19th, it was reported that Ukraine created a temporary special commission to track the flow of weapons into the country. I would call it incoherent policy, all right? If we are, if the United States policy is to support Ukraine in, its, in the defense of its country against the Russian Federation, you can't go halfway with that. You, you see what I'm saying? You can't, you can't create artificial lines, and I would challenge anyone to say otherwise. We're either in or we're not. We're now in the heart of the Donbass region, which is the most heavily contested part of Ukraine. And following the convoy here, is particularly unnerving because they've been asking for anti-drone equipment, which tells you that there are drones in the sky. Clearly within artillery range as well. Um, so we probably shouldn't stay here for any longer than we need to. We are in the middle of nowhere. This is just Donbass. Who the f does such a thing? It's just, you know, it makes no sense whatsoever, whatsoever. One of the big questions uh, moving forward is, will there be a long-running Ukrainian insurgency in areas held by the Russians? Uh, and I think the answer to that is probably yes, but it depends what territories the Russians hold, how many of the Ukrainians that are in those territories stay, but you could still see partisans, Ukrainian units of one sort or another infiltrating across the border into Russia-occupied territories to make any continuing Russian occupation costly and bloody. As we fuel Ukraine with so much of this, isn't there a danger that we're just creating the next insurgency, the next failed state? That's uh, one of the reasons we have to win the war. I mean, if we lose the war, if we have this kind of gray zone, semi-failed state scenario or something like that, that's why we've got to win. If you do this, you funnel lots of the resource into place and lose, uh, then you will have to, to, to face the consequences. 